Amen. So before we uh, jump into the section of chapter three that we're gonna look at today, I wanna talk about an idea or a concept that I think is very foundational and important for us to understand this passage and this message, I think the way that God's calling us to. And it's a, it's a truth that I think exists for all people, this idea or this concept, and it's really important. So I'm gonna illustrate it by saying that I'm a Denver Broncos fan. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. It's just rare, you know, in Oklahoma to find the, what? Well, anyway, we'll, we'll leave it alone. But um, I'm a Denver Broncos fan, okay? And it's like, it's, a, it's kind of a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, okay, uh, right now. Um, but, you know, there's a bright future, right? Amen. Okay. Anyway, I'm a Denver Broncos fan. So I was born in Denver, Colorado. I moved away from Denver, Colorado when I was three years old. My parents have always lived in Colorado. That's where they, they grew up. My, they lived in Denver for a long time. Like it makes, they're Broncos fans because that's just, that's been their whole life. And it's a huge deal in the house. You know, I remember like growing up, it was always just like the Broncos were on because my, my parents loved the Denver Broncos. That's where they were, uh, that's where they lived in Colorado. And I remember, so there was a quarterback, John Elway, that in our house, his name was St. John Elway. Okay. That's what we called him. And my, my dad has newspaper clippings still in his closet of like when the Broncos won the Super Bowl and it's all right there. And he, he met John Elway and that for the longest time was the coolest thing about my dad to me was that he had had lunch with John Elway because it was such a big deal in our house. We're Broncos fans. Now it makes sense that my parents are Broncos fans, but the question is why am I a Broncos fan? Like I, I, I don't live in Colorado. I didn't live there very much. And I did not, absolutely not, look at all of the NFL teams and make a decision based on all the facts and figures who I wanted to support. I'm a Denver Broncos fan because that's the house I grew up in. And I love being a Denver Broncos fan, but it's, it's how I was raised. That's the house that I grew up in. It was what was on. That's, you know, when we were watching, I said, Dad, who are we rooting for? He said, the Broncos, right? That's just what, and, and so I'm a Denver Broncos fan. And that, on a large scale, is what happens to all of us throughout our life, that there are all these things, the way that we're raised, the house that we're in, the families that we have, where we're born, all of that stuff forms who we are. And, and, and it forms who we are, and I don't even have to do anything to make it happen. It just happens to me. I put in no effort. All I have to do is live, and the family that I'm in, and what news station is on, and where I was born, all those things start to form who I am. And there's a pastor that I listen to all the time. He's great. His name is John Mark Comer. He calls this unintentional spiritual formation. Unintentional spiritual formation. That I have to put in no effort, no work of my own. All I have to do is live and all these things start to form who I am and what I think and what I believe. All of those voices that are there form who I am. I'm a Denver Broncos fan because I was just born and raised in that house. So what we need and what John Mark Comer calls intentional spiritual formation. So the reality is Jesus came, and we say this, this phrase all the time, he came to create an upside down kingdom. Jesus changed the way that humans work. He came and said, we're gonna do this a whole new way. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses a phrase over and over again. He says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So you've heard it said, this is how you've grown up. This is what it's always been. This is unintentional spiritual formation. This is just where you've, uh, who you are, who you've listened to, where you live. All those things have formed. But I say to you, I'm here to switch this up. I'm here to change this. It's intentional spiritual formation. And I bring all of this up because the passage we're going to look at today, I think underneath it has a, a challenge for all of us to recognize that all of us do have um, places in our life where we have been formed unintentionally. I have all these thoughts and opinions and ideas about who God is and how life works. And it's not because it's what he said, it's what I've just grown up around. And so we need to recognize that this morning and we need to intentionally seek and know that God has a different way. And we need to switch our spiritual perspective this morning and seek out what it is that God has for us. And we're going to be bringing up this idea kind of throughout unintentional spiritual formation versus intentional spiritual formation. And so um, 
to, to kind of sum up where, we, we, where we're going to be um, in Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12. The first uh, verses, 1 through 11, Paul um, kind of continues on his thought from the last chapter about unity, about bringing together of these different people underneath Jesus. And then he kind of goes into some of his history. And we've talked about this a lot when we did our series Acts part 2. We talked about Paul and that he was called by God, this specific calling to preach to the Gentiles, to bring them in and to make sure that they know who Jesus is. We talked about Paul and Barnabas and the church in Antioch, all that stuff. Paul goes into some of that history saying, this is what I've been called to do by God is to preach the good news to the Gentiles and bring them in to this family. So that kind of gets us all the way up to verse 12. So we're going to start here and we're going to spend some time on, on these a couple verses. So Ephesians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now boldly and confidently uh, come into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. So the first part of that verse is we're going to spend some time. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can uh, now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. And I start with this, and I want to spend some time here because this is a massive, massive spiritual truth that will change how we live, change how we pray, change how we interact with God. But we have to recognize for a second what I just talked about, this unintentional spiritual formation. Every single one of us has been unintentionally formed um, how to approach and handle authority figures. So we're going to get into that in just a second. But Paul says, be, be, be bold and be confident. So the Greek word for bold or boldness is parousia, parousia. And its literal meanings are freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, openly, frankly, without concealment, uh, without ambiguity or circumlocution. That's a new word for me this morning, okay? So you're welcome. Without the use of figures and comparisons. Boldly, that's what it means. So I want us to think about for a second when you, uh, when you go ask for like a bank loan or something or you're asking your boss for a raise, there's all this nervousness. I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm timid and I've got to make sure I've got all my stuff. I've got to make sure I have all my facts and figures on why this is going to happen and why I deserve this and why you can do this. And I've got some nervousness then I'm feeling a bit timid about it. Or you think about this, like when you were a little kid and you were asking your parents if a friend could come spend the night, you've never been more prepared for that conversation, right? And you go in and you're like, I'm, I'm not gonna say it right away. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna like kind of butter them up a little bit, talk about how great they are, right? Kind of test the water, see the mood they're in, find my way kind of to sneak this in. I think about, because my son, He's got this game on my phone that he loves to play. It's like a Sonic racing game. And he's and like, I know when he wants to play it because he comes up and he goes, Dad, first off, let me just say I love you. Let me start there, okay? I think you're great. And I really appreciate, I'm a fan of your work, you know? And uh, <clears throat> can I play Sonic? You know, like that's, he starts by, he's like, okay, I can't jump in right away. I've got to kind of, I got to figure this out. I got to make sure he's in the right mood. Say the things that I need to say. Get him in that place before I say something. The Greek word for confidence or to go confidently is pepoethesis. And again, I, this, I've got gibberish up here. and Just trust me that that's what it says, okay? I don't even know what these words are. Pepoethesis, okay? The Greek word for confidence. And it means trust and assurance. Again, think back to our sort of examples. You're asking for a raise. You're asking for a loan or something. And this is how I am. And I was thinking about, you know, when I go in, you're asking for a loan or something from a bank, I'm already doing, I'm like, they're going to say no, right? <laughs> like, uh, there's going to be something that I don't know about. They've got something or they're going to find something that I have no idea about and we're not going to get the loan and it's not going to happen. I'm starting to say no. I've got no trust or assurance. I'm nervous. I'm timid. I've got all my facts and figures. I'm ready to say all the things that I need to say. That's how we have been unintentionally formed to handle those situations. And let's not lose it for a second that that is, um, I think, very apparent oftentimes how we come in and we talk to God. Here's the, here, here's the reality. I know this verse with my lips, but I don't know if my heart and my body knows it all the way. I think there are so many times in my life, my day-to-day -day with God, where I don't have the boldness and the confidence that Paul's talking about. And I'm coming in with God, and I've got to make sure I've got all my stuff here right? And I've got the past three months of sin bank statements ready to go. If he wants to look at them, I'm like, God, let me, before I even jump in, let me say, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for this. You're great, by the way. Let me tell you, I love you. 
Thank you, right? We, we have to say all the things that we have to say. And then if I've done all that right, let me ask for the thing that I want to ask for. That's oftentimes how it looks when I walk in and I talk to God in his throne room. But I love what Paul, or Paul, Josh, Pastor Josh is great, but I don't know if he's Paul, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> what Pastor Josh was just saying during that prayer, he's saying, no, because of Jesus, because of Christ, we get to walk boldly in. And so because of the finished work of Christ on the cross, don't miss that piece. Because of what Jesus has done, not for just no reason at all, because of Jesus and because of his work on the cross, we get to with boldness and confidence. I don't have to have my facts and figures. I don't have to weave my way in the conversation to the point that I want to. I don't have to feel afraid or nervous or scared. I get to boldly, confidently walk in. That's the gift of God for believers day one of being a believer. That's the other thing. You know how like you, can, like you get a job and it's like, hey, some of these benefits kick in like 30 days in. There's no, none of that with God. You don't have to wait a year through this trial period and then you get to have this boldness and confidence. Because of Christ, day one, you give your life to Jesus. You get to walk boldly and confidently into the throne room of God. So here's my question for us. What do your prayers look like? How, how do you approach God? Honestly, think about that for a moment. Do you come with like, man, I've got, I've got to have all my kind of, you know, all my stuff and I've got to be prepared and I'm kind of nervous. What if he says no, all of those things? What does it look like? Here's what I've written down just for myself. You don't have to sugarcoat it. You don't have to put a happy twist on it. You don't have to have yourself all put together because Jesus is all put together and he gave you his put togetherness. I don't have to have it all together. Jesus has it all together. And he's gifted me his righteousness. On the cross purchased for me, he took my sin, he gave me his righteousness. Because of that, I get to walk into God in prayer, bold and confident, right? I don't have to, uh, what I can do is I can be the person that walks in at three in the morning and I don't even have my thoughts fully put together. I don't even know how I'm going to say this, but I feel the confidence to walk into the throne room of God and ask for what I want to ask for. But if we're not careful, we let unintentional spiritual formation shape how we talk to God. This is how it was with my dad, or this is how it was with my boss. This is how it was when I had to go talk to this person. And I put that on him. Don't put that on him. He's saying because of Jesus, you get to be bold and confident when it comes to your prayer life with him. So we're going to break up the rest of our sort of section this morning into three chunks to kind of look at and, and, and break apart. So chunk number one that we're going to look at, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 17. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So Paul prays. This whole rest of this section we're going to look at is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And I think by extension to us, okay? This is Paul's prayer for us. That from God's glorious unlimited resources, he would empower you with inner strength. Or the phrase that I'm going to use, other translations say, is he empowers you with strength in your inner being, through the spirit of Christ in you. He empowers you with strength in your inner being. And I want us to look, there's another, um, uh, another place in Romans where Paul uses the same idea, the same phrase of inner being, and it just helps us to understand what exactly he's talking about. So Romans 7, 22 through 23. Uh, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So Paul breaks apart. He's like, there's these two pieces of me. He's like, I I, I love the law of God in my inner being, in my heart, in my will, my, you know, who I am on the inside. But then in my outer being, in my members, I I feel this other thing happening. And there's this distinction a little bit between these two pieces of who we are. And what Paul's praying for here in Ephesians 3, 4, is that you'd be strengthened in your inner being through the power of the spirit at work in you. That there's this idea that it's our will, it's our character, it's our values, it's the way that we make decisions, it's our personality. God wants that to be strong. 
He's going to empower you with inner strength through the spirit of Christ in you. That's what the idea here that Paul is getting at. It's not just about this outward strength. It's an inner strength to be able to make decisions, to have character, to have values, to seek after God, to change the way that you used to live into the way that God wants you to live. God's empowering you with inner strength. The other name for this or word for this is sanctification. That's the process um, that God has every single Christian in, changing us from who we were into somebody who looks more and sounds more and acts more like Jesus. And it's a process day by day. What he's doing is he's empowering you with inner strength through the spirit of Christ. He's making sure that you are getting empowered, that you are getting fed, that you are getting supplied with strength in your inner being. That's what he's after. That's what he's praying for. And I think, you know, I think about my own story, being a, being a young guy, being a teenager, struggling with lust and struggling with things. I mean, I'm like, I'm not supposed to feel this way. And if you're anything like kind of me, it was once I really gave my life to Jesus, there was a shift, something happened where it's like stuff that was okay before all of a sudden starts to feel less okay. Like stuff that I had no problem doing over here, I've given my life to Jesus and now there's something kind of happening in my heart where it's like, oh, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. And what's happening is the spirit of God given to me because of Jesus and because of my trust in him, this gift of God, now he's starting to empower me with strength in my inner being. I'm like, man, I can't do that anymore. And now I'm kind of in this struggle. Before I didn't even struggle to think about these things, but now I'm like, man, I can't do that. And I wanna surround myself with people that are gonna help me and I wanna dig into God's word and I wanna spend time in prayer. He's strengthening, empowering in your inner being. And God does this over your whole life. I think about right now, my struggle at this moment is contentment. That's my struggle. That's where I'm constantly at a wrestle. And I'm like, man, if I'm honest, I go through these huge seasons of life where it's like, I do want more. And I don't find myself happy or content with what I do have. And I wish I had this. I wish I had that. And all of those thoughts. And I keep having to bring that to God. And I watch as he has, he gives me this like these little moments where Sarah and I are sitting in the backyard and we're looking at the kids jumping on the trampoline. And we're like, this is pretty good. And I'm watching and, and seeing how God is little by little empowering me with strength in my inner being through the power of the Holy Spirit within me to make these changes, to improve the way that he's calling me to improve. That's what we need, strength in our inner being. God is empowering you with strength in your inner being through the spirit of God within you. Don't forget that. It's not your strength. He's not empowering you with anything else. He's empowering you with inner strength through his spirit. So the next uh, piece of this verse that I want us to look at, we're gonna throw the verse back up there. At the end of this, he says, your roots, he prays that your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So he uses this picture of like being planted, drawing energy, drawing vitality, drawing life from something. And he prays that your your roots would be planted, would be uh, growing down into God's love and that that would be keeping you strong. So again, let's pause for just a moment and let's think about, let's recognize how have you been unintentionally formed in this way? What do your roots grow down into? What has the world told you to grow your roots into when you need to make decisions, when you need something, when you need strength, when you need to be strong, your roots grow down into your accomplishments. This is all the stuff that I've done and so that's why I can do this. My roots grow down into the ways that I've succeeded in the past, into my accomplishments, or your roots grow down into your education. I went to this school, I got this degree, this is the professor that I had, whatever it is, that's where it goes. If I need to feel strong, if I need to make the choices I need to make, my roots grow down into my family, into myself. I've got the strength to do this. I'm the one that's gotten me this far. My roots grow down into myself or into my money or my knowledge of scripture or my church attendance or the way that I serve or that I lead a life group. That's what my roots grow into, all of my stuff. This is what we've been unintentionally formed to think and believe and do from all these other places. If you're in trouble, you get yourself out of it. If, you're, if you need something, you grow down into yourself. You've got what you need or, or you grow into your accomplishments, you go into your, your bank account, your whatever. And what Paul is praying for is he's saying, I pray that you'd be rooted in God's love. That's where you draw strength. None of these things are the ultimate source of strength and vitality for you as a Jesus follower. God's love is. 
We need to grow down into God's love. I heard a pastor one time give this as an, a, an illustration. He said, oftentimes Christians will treat God's love like a stream that we walk across when we're on a hike. He's like, we're on a hike, we're moving up to the mountain, that's where we're going, we're going to the top, that's the goal. But we see this kind of little stream and it's God's love and we're like, oh, it's so beautiful, like I love that. Like I'm gonna pause here for a second and appreciate this little stream and it's kind of nice, sounds nice. But then what I do is I step right over it and I move on to the bigger and better things. I've got a place that I've gotta go, this was a nice pause, a nice thing, I appreciated it. But now I'm moving on to the bigger and better thing. And he's saying, in reality, God's love is an ocean. It's the whole journey. And it's what we will spend and should spend our whole lives diving into and exploring and learning more about. But he's saying so many Christians are just standing on the shore thinking that that's it. That God's love is sort of the first step. Let's understand this cool little thing over here. And then we move on to the bigger and better stuff. We move on to the more important. This is basic and we graduate onto what it is that God has for us. It's not basic. It's not step one. God's love is the whole thing. God's love is the ocean that we need to spend our lives exploring. Another quote here that I have from John Mark Comer. Again, I'm gonna get his name tattooed right here, I think in a little bit, just because uh, he's great. But he has this quote, so many Christians simply have no idea of the staggering immensity of God's love for them and of that love's power to transform them into people of love, as well as bring them great happiness and lasting peace. If they knew they would undoubtedly do whatever it takes to make time to be with him. That we have no idea of the staggering immensity of God's love. It's not the basic, it's not the foundation, and then you go on to something else. It's the whole thing, God's love. You'd be rooted in God's love for you, and that's what keeps you strong. And now we're gonna move on. So Paul, just kind of the second chunk we're gonna look at, he just really uh, explores this idea about God's love. Ephesians chapter three, verse 18 and 19. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I, he prays that you would have power as all Christ's people should, as all the church should. What the height, the depth, the, the width, um, how, how long it is, all these different dimensions and ideas about how much God loves you. All these different ways that you can explore and experience God's love. And he wants you to see that it's so much more than you think it is. I love, he says, hey, I pray that you would understand. I pray that you would know and experience. But by the way, you'll never fully understand. Like, I pray that you would understand, but you'll never fully understand how wide his love is. When you explore how wide his love is, you'll realize it's wider than you thought. And when you explore how long his love is, it'll be longer than you thought. And how deep his love is, it's deeper than you thought. How high his love is, it's more than you thought. That it's, this, uh, it's, it's so much that we can't even fully understand it, but we're invited to understand I love this idea. It's like God wants to be understood. He can be understood and will always be understanding more. That's how God works. He, he wants to be understood and he's saying, I can be. But by the way, you'll always be understanding. You never come at this place where, where you've arrived. You know all about it. But you're going to constantly be learning more about who he is and what his love is like. I think about with my own kids. I've got two kids and... Like I know them and I understand them, right? Like this is how Reese is gonna respond to this. This is how Beck is gonna respond to this. This is what Reese likes. This is what Beck likes. I understand them. But then every single day I'm learning that there's so much more about them that I don't know. That I'm constantly understanding and learning more about who they are. That there's this whole new dimension to who Reese is or who Beck is. And I'm learning that they've got this kind of personality and they can do this and this is the way that they think and this is the way that they work. So it's like I understand my kids and I'm always understanding them more. That's the invitation from God uh, to us. He's saying, understand, but by the way, you'll never fully understand. Dive into this, but by the way, it'll always go deeper. Explore this, but by the way, it always goes wider. I pray that you would be rooted in God's love and that would keep you strong. Be rooted in the love of God. 
the final chunk of the passage that I want to explore um, is the kind of the way that he ends his prayer here, Ephesians chapter 3, 20 through 21. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Again, I just feel like he's just writing and he's like, by the end of it, you know, he's just like forever and ever. Amen. He's like, like, it's just like, it's just such a good ending to this whole thing. But I want to take us back just for a moment with this passage in mind to kind of how we started this idea of boldness and confidence. That we would, that we would be bold and confident because he tells us here, um, who, God is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. Infinitely more than we could ask or think. Amen. So here's what I have. Don't put a box around God. Don't, don't set boundaries for him. He can do infinitely more than you could ask or imagine. Also, don't do this. Don't say no for God. Amen. This is the piece that I've been wrestling with this whole kind of week. He's saying, come bold, come confident, come asking. And by the way, I can do infinitely more than you could ask or imagine. I constantly am saying no for God. And I'm walking in, and, but before I even get to the prayer, I've got all the reasons why. It's like, it's, it's his will, it's not my will, and I fully know that. And I don't need this from God. You know, like, I know he loves me, and I know that I don't actually need this. This would be nice. And by the end of that conversation, I don't ask him anything. Because I said no for him. Don't say no for God. Let God say no for himself. If he's going to say no or yes, he'll say it. But he's saying ask. And by the way, if you can ask this, he can do infinitely more. And if you can ask this, he can do infinitely more. It's always true. So ask, be bold, be confident. Walk in at three in the morning and ask him. I've got some other verses for us just to drill this point home. In Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Saying, ask him, right? Don't, don't, don't be all worried about this. Just bring it to him, ask. But, 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 but should I, uh, I gotta kind of get ready for it, right? I gotta say it the right way. I've gotta put all the right words in place so that, no, 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 he's just saying, bring it to him, ask. That's, right. That's what you have to do. James chapter four, verse two, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. I love how straight up blunt that is, right? You have not because you ask not, the other translation says. But you, you don't have what you want, and why don't you have what you want? Because you haven't asked God for it. So ask him, man, I really want this. It's like, well, have you asked, have you asked God? And if you asked God with boldness and confidence, or if you kind of wiggled your way through and kind of said some things over here, kind of see you know, how, how God's feeling today. And then maybe if it all kind of works out, I can ask him for the thing I want to ask him for. And I'm saying, no, you don't have because you don't ask. So just come ask and don't say no for him, right? Because here's the thing, like don't, God might say no, but I'll let him say no. I'm going to ask. James chapter 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. I love this. If you need wisdom, it's like, ask God, he'll give it to you. And he won't even be mad you asked, right? I've been unintentionally formed to think if I have a problem and I ask, what the answer I'm going to get is, well, you got yourself into this situation. Because like, you're asking me for wisdom, you're the one that made the mess. That's what I start to think, right? If, I, if I've got a problem, I have to come and there, what, what I'm gonna hear is, well, like, well, you did that, so I'm not. What do you, what do you need help from me from, right? And what he's saying here is he's like, I, God never gets mad at you for asking. He knows you made the mess. And he's saying, if you want wisdom, yeah, ask for it. Ask, don't say no for God. Well, do I have to do all this right? Do I have to say this? Do I have to come in? No, ask him, ask God and he does not rebuke you for asking. So as we get ready to close, got a couple, uh, couple more ideas here for us. We need to recognize and know that we have been unintentionally formed in our life when it comes to prayer, when it comes to being in God's presence, when it comes to spending time with him, when it comes to um, what we need to do to strengthen ourselves, to make the right decisions, to make the changes we need to make. 
And all of it has been backwards. All of it is not what God actually has for us. That's the reality that we need to face and we need to go, okay, if that's the case, I need to intentionally plug into the right places and listen to the right voices and recognize I need to get my ideas, my source, my wisdom from Him. I need to be formed by what He says I am and what He says about life and reality. And we sang this morning and we're gonna sing it again in just a second, that I am who you say I am. That's the reality that I'm gonna choose to plug into and listen to. That's how I'm gonna um, realize who I am is not by all this other stuff, but you. I'm gonna intentionally seek to be with you, intentionally seek to get plugged into the right voices, intentionally seek to know that the spirit is empowering me with strength in my inner being, intentionally make sure I'm rooted in God's love, not anything else. That's what I need to do. We're all being formed into something, every single one of us. We're all being formed into someone. And the question that I feel like God was asking me this week is, are you being formed into a bold, confident, Holy Spirit filled and empowered, rooted and grounded in God's love person? Or are you being formed into a timid and ashamed, self-filled and empowered, rooted and grounded in ego and self-accomplishment person? Because one of those is happening. And one of them's happening without me even thinking about it. And so I need to choose, I need to recognize if I want this prayer, if I want these blessings, I need to realize, man, I've got to step into that. I've got to recognize and plug into the right places. I need to grow down my roots into the right stuff. I had a mentor um, when I was at Bible college and we would meet up like once a week for coffee and that sort of thing. And he shared with me that he was in this place in his faith and his journey with Jesus for what he was starting to do is he was saying, I don't want to say anymore when somebody reads a verse or they, you know, a, a spiritual truth or something really cool that Jesus revealed or whatever. He's like, I don't want to say, oh, that's so cool or that's so interesting or that's so beautiful. He's like, I don't want to say that anymore. What I want to say is that sound, that's, that's hard, but I want to do it. It's like, that's what I want to say. Because if we're not careful, these are just pretty words. And we read them, we go, wow, that's so great. And that's, oh man, I love that Paul said that. And then we'll close the Bible and we'll just go on being unintentionally formed into something. Or I can say, wow, that sounds hard, but I wanna do it. I need to make the changes in my life to be rooted in God's love, not myself. I need to realize that the Holy Spirit's empowering me, not myself empowering me. I need to realize that I can boldly and confidently walk into God's throne room and ask him for things. And I don't need to say no for him. And that's not cool, that's hard, but I wanna do it. I wanna make the changes that I need to make. It's pretty words until we make a shift in our spiritual perspective to realize these are uh, blessings that are available to us. But I've gotta seek it, intentionally be formed by who Jesus is and what he says about me. Would y'all stand up? We're gonna pray together. Jesus, we love you so much. God, we're grateful, so grateful this morning uh, for who you are, God, for what you've done on the cross, God, what you've done for us. And I thank you, God, that what that's allowed us to do. And so Holy Spirit, help us to take a moment right here, right now to recognize what's available to us. God, that we can be bold and confident when it comes to our relationship with you. God, would you... Um, Help us to see where we've put other relationships, unintentionally formed habits, and we've put those on you, God. Would you free us from those? God, would you help us to realize that you have in yourself created a brand new group of people that operates a brand new way? And God, would you help us to realize and know that you're calling us into something brand new? And God, that we would be formed by that, formed by you, by your word, by your truth formed, God, by the, by the family of God around us, God, that's encouraging us to the truth. God, would you help us to know and recognize that we have the spirit of God active and working in us, God, empowering us and strengthening us in our inner being to make choices, God, to make changes, to build our character, God, to, to change our values. 
And God, would you show us right now, God, when, when things get tough, God, or when we need strength, we need something, God, show us right now, what do our roots grow into automatically? What are the things, God, that we draw from? God, help us to, to recognize that, God, and help us to, to, to move away from that, God, repent from that, turn from that, and plant ourselves rooted in your love. God, would you help all of us to be on a lifelong pursuit, God, to understand how wide your love is and how high your love is and how long your love is and how deep your love is. And I thank you that in that pursuit, God, we'll never actually even see the bottom. We'll never actually see, God, how much it is. But the more that we understand, the deeper that we dive, God, the more that we will be rooted and grounded in who you are and your love for us. God, we wanna be a people that look more like Jesus and so help us to intentionally seek you. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.